Hello everybody, another ranking video. If you like ranking videos, this one is for you. So um, right now I'm actually working on a much larger ranking video with all the studio albums by Jethro Tull, including all the solo records by Ian Anderson. But this is a total mayhem, to be honest. So I thought before I'm finished with that, and this was to take some work because I'm listening to so many records by Jethro Tull. Um, so I thought I will just slip something in between. And what about making a ranking of all the albums by the British band The Nice? And uh, I've already made I've already made the video with the ranking of Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. So uh, it kind of makes sense to go even a little back in time and have a look at Keith Emerson's vibrant project called The Nice. Now the interesting thing about The Nice is that um, they were foremost a live band in my opinion and uh, one could make the argument that The Nice never really reached their full potential as a studio band and oftentimes they kind of padded their albums and uh, just kind of tried to finish them by adding live tracks uh, so it's all very sketchy with the nice um, it's probably not a uh, band famous for their studio recordings and um, in many sense musically they were just kind of uh, ahead of their time and also the i think the recording technology of those years just wasn't ready for all these bold ideas that keith emerson had and uh, as I said, there are this kind of vibrant London-based uh, uh, live band constantly appearing in the marquee and uh, very influential, very influential on other bands and very popular amongst other musicians at the time. And uh, certainly um, the one band that uh, was a massive influence on a future genre called progressive rock and um, as such is being sometimes slightly overlooked which probably has to do with the fact that they were this strong flamboyant live act uh, but are not that much remembered for their studio albums anyway to get some meat into the ranking here i will consider as much of their records as possible and ignore only general compilations and best of records or decades later released live albums that leaves us with five records and here they are ranked by my taste and my taste only number five the thoughts of emerlist dubject from 1967 an album with a really nice psychedelic vibe some really cool bass playing by lee jackson and guitar solos by davy olist who quickly left the band after this record which was certainly a vacuum that Emerson gladly filled with his organ playing and that way transformed the band into this three-piece blueprint for Emerson, Lake and Palmer, basically. Certainly the nice sometimes feels like this training ground for a three-piece prog rock band focused on keyboards. For me, the absolute highlight here is the most overlooked track on this album, if not in the entire The Nice catalog, an original composition called Dawn, penned by Davison, Emerson and Jackson. Now that's some amazing pushing of the envelope, experimental, atmospheric, weird and yet at the same time very captivating. The Thoughts of Emerlis Dovejack is not a bad album, provided you like the quirky, whimsical British psychedelia of the 60s. A bit of a time capsule documenting where the band was in 1967 and there's a lot of effort here to break the mold and to do something entirely new while reflecting the psychedelic scene in London at the time. It is the last place in my list but that doesn't mean that it's not worth looking into. Number four, Elegy from 1971. As an album it is more an afterthought by the record company at this point in time Emerson was already involved in ELP, but still a nice object of musical research. This album certainly can fill some interesting gaps. It starts with Hang On To A Dream by Tim Hardin. This is the live version, quite great stuff, very jazzy and a solid showcase for Emerson's piano skills. It is a recording from the legendary Fillmore East. Next there is uh, My Back Pages, another tune by Bob Dylan, which The Nice did a lot covering Bob Dylan, but again turned here into something entirely different. 
This is a studio recording, but it certainly sounds like a one take recording without any overdubs. My highlight here is Pathetic Third Movement by Tchaikovsky, quite outstanding Hammond organ mayhem and also great tribal drumming by Brian Davison. For me, the highlight on this album. Unlike in the version on Five Bridges, we'll get to that, this version here is recorded in studio but without any orchestra, only the band, which again makes it sound like a strong blueprint for ELP. The cover of this record was done by Hypnosis. This is one of their early works but already checking all the surreal boxes. Number three is Nice from 1969. Um, this was released in the United States under the title Everything as Nice as Mother Makes It um, with a completely different cover. Uh, certainly a better cover than this one. I have a tendency to call it uh, Nice, like the French city Nice, because uh, it's kind of weird if you are a band called The Nice and then you make an album called Nice. Uh, it's slightly confusing. Besides, this is a really horrendous cover. I mean, this is really bad. I understand the idea. It's supposed to look like a photo album, but the photographs here are really awful. <laughs> and uh, I know for a fact that uh, Keith Emerson had a, quite a meltdown after the record company showed him the cover design, so he was not happy with it. But the funny thing is those, those photos are and they are so uh, mediocre and so meaningless that you could actually claim that they've been taken in the French city of Nice and uh, it would be absolutely believable because these photos, these snapshots could have been taken anywhere. So that's why I call this album Nice. Now this album starts with Azrael Revisited, a really intriguing edgy song, very interesting, actually one of my favorite nice songs, kind of brooding, but at the same time there is this element of Latin music. Uh, there is Hang On To A Dream by the folk singer and songwriter Tim Hardin, but in the studio version. Now this is a beautiful adaptation, that's great fun to listen. This rendition was a standard song um, in their live set. Diary of an Empty Day is an adaptation of a composition by Eduard Lalo. Now, I don't think it works too well, but those are the beginnings of a method that would make Emerson famous one day, the adaptation of classical material into rock. For example, is a song written by Emerson and Jackson. It is not a very good song, but the quality here is about all the stuff they built around the song. But it sounds quite weird, kind of like a mixture of Vanilla Fudge and Captain Beefheart. The B-side is entirely live, dominated by a very nice, no pun intended, a very nice version of the famous Rondo, recorded in Fillmore East in 1969. That is actually a very good live recording and quite impressive, because it delivers a little bit of the atmosphere of a band that was mostly conceived as a strong live act. So there was always something about the chemistry of Nice that was lost in studio. The last track is another adaptation of Bob Dylan called She Belongs to Me turned into a 12 minute long epic. I like the interplay between Lee and Keith, that's certainly pretty edgy for 1969. And as you would expect the original Dylan tune is completely lost behind this arrangement. So this is not a bad record, oftentimes somewhat overlooked, but it has some strong very psychedelic moments with all kind of early day prog rock ideas. So while it is a product of its time, it also pushed the envelope quite a lot. Number two, Five Bridges, released in 1970. This is a concept album or a symphonic composition written about the UK city of Newcastle upon Tyne. But actually this performance took place in Croydon. Um, the band here is accompanied by the Sinfonia of London Orchestra, conducted by Joseph Eger. The first two tracks are actually entirely orchestral and the band comes in in the third track. It's an unusual album and certainly somewhat disjointed, but you have to appreciate the effort for innovation and to do things differently. It's so crazy that Deep Purple beat them to it with their own orchestral album, despite the Nice having recorded this one earlier, but they just took longer to release it. But doing stuff like that was kind of their corner of the market. The live performance 
that takes like 70 or 80 percent of the album uh, with the orchestra is followed by a bonus track or additional track called one of those people which is a rather obscure studio track but somewhat fascinating it sounds like the lost older brother to living sin by emerson like and palmer from their trilogy album it's kind of very edgy very weird my favorite on this album is a uh, high level fugue for the bridge um, this is pretty cool and overall this is an interesting album and an impressive live sound. It's not a record album I would return to often. You kind of have to be in the mood, but I'm impressed uh, by this bold production and how great it actually sounds. And finally, number one is the album Ars Longa Vita Brevis from 1968. The album starts with a track called Daddy, Where Did I Come From? Obviously a very tongue-in-a-cheek song poking fun at adults being always at loss of words when they have to talk to children about sex. Followed by Little Arabella, which is actually Keith Emerson singing, which is rarely a good idea. But this is the one song where it works very nice actually. It's a quite a whimsical song, but rather endearing. The next track is Happy Freud's, another song that's very 60s. But uh, it's a pretty cool song, and I like Emerson's courage to call certain things out. Thematically, it's kind of a song about all the esoteric mumbo-jumbo that was so omnipresent in those days. Well, actually, it never went away, right? How to understand yourself, be yourself, contact your inner self, reach your full potential. I think that's when all this stuff with guidebooks started. Also, the 60s were really obsessed with psychotherapy. So Emerson is making fun of all the, all the people that get played for a sucker by self-improvement books. Next comes the Intermezzo from the Karelia Suite. Okay, this is an adaptation of the Finnish composer Sibelius. But here we get a very first good taste of the whole classic adaptation game that became so prevalent with Emerson, Lake and Palmer. But it is a good showcase for Lee Jackson. The bass lines are not that difficult here, but very present and very in front of the whole thing. The B-side is all the Ars Longer Vita Brevis suite, almost 20 minutes long and probably the band's biggest artistic achievement. I think it stands the test of time. At the same time, you can immerse yourself into this mammoth of a composition and try to picture how this must have been received in 1968. I mean, people already had their first wave of uh, innovation with Sgt. Pepper by Beatles, but this was the next round of crazy back in the day, but in style. So no, no doubt this is the nicest best album. People like to say the first proper prog album was in the court of the Crimson King, which came out in the late summer or fall of 1969. So good 10 months after this album. But I would say that this is certainly a quite fundamental stepping stone of the whole genre and my favorite nice album. And uh, that was it for now. And now I can return to my Jethro Tull ranking and try to finish it somehow. Have a good day. Goodbye.